What's up? This is Seth Mosley. You're with us on the Made It in Music podcast, and we've got a good one today. We've got my friend Zach Kale, and I'm going to intro him here in just a second. But before we jump in, in case you haven't heard, here at Full Circle Music, we have a ton of resources for all of you pursuing a career in the music industry. One of those awesome resources is our Song Chasers songwriting course. The course is a full-scale, complete look at the process of writing consistent hit commercial songs. If you want to become a professional songwriter, this course will be invaluable to you. I, I teach you everything that I know about songwriting in the course. The Song Chasers course is $9.97, and once you buy it, you have access to it forever. To purchase the course, head to members.fullcirclemusic.com and click on Song Chasers. All right. Our guest today is Zach Kale. In just the past couple of years, Zach Kale has emerged as a successful Nashville songwriter and producer. First landed a cut with Florida Georgia Line. Once in Nashville, he signed a music publishing deal with Sony ATV Music and began working with hit songwriter John Knight. With John, he co-wrote the big hit, I Hope, for rising star Gabby Barrett, which was number one on the Billboard Hot Country Songs chart for nine weeks straight. Impressively, I Hope has also become a major pop hit, reaching top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, and that is incredibly rare, by the way. Kale's developed a special collaboration with Barrett, and in addition to I Hope, he wrote and produced seven more songs with Barrett for her debut album, Goldmine. Besides his work with Barrett, Kale's co-written songs for Keith Urban, Florida Georgia Line, Jimmy Allen, Chase Rice, Hootie and the Blowfish, Chris Bandy, and other artists. Zach is also an artist, helping found a super secret band who are rising stars signed to Universal Republic Records, who the world will hear about very soon. It's so secret that I can't even tell you the name yet. So I'm so excited to learn more about Zach's story. Zach, thanks for being with us today. Man, my pleasure, bro. It's so good to be here. Dude, you are the man. I, uh, I just, I've, I've so appreciated getting to know you over the, the past few years, and you've been, been a part of some of our Academy events. Just so gracious to always come on and, and, and share your insights and your knowledge with people. So um, I, I'm really excited to have you here. So I, I'd love to just jump in. How did you get started as a musician and a songwriter? Man, like my dad, I grew up in Alabama. And so my dad was a, uh, was a, he, he was a guitar player in a small band. And then he did like the wedding band stuff, but he was also a band director at the same time and music minister at our church and everything. And so I kind of like fell into it, right? You just, you had no choice but to do music. And it, it honestly never felt forced either. Like my dad wasn't, I mean, we were always just playing basketball in the, in the driveway. It was not, not a, Hey, you're doing music type of thing, but I just fell into it naturally. And, uh, and I just, I just fell in love with playing guitar and writing songs. I remember when I first picked up a guitar, uh, I did, I, as soon as I learned chords, it wasn't, Hey, what? And back in the day, it was like, man, that was a long time ago. So it was like, what, what Tomlin song can I sing? It wasn't, it wasn't that it was, Hey, what, what song would sound good with these chords, you know? And I just kind of make something up and it was, I'm sure it's pure trash, but it was also pure fun at the same time. That's awesome, man. So what got you to Nashville? I mean, what was the the journey coming to Music City? Man, you know, I uh, growing up in Alabama, it was like an hour and a half south of um, of Nashville. And my, my my uncle used to produce this show called The Crook and Chase Show a long time ago in, in Nashville. And so I, I, I was used to Nashville my whole life. And, and I always, there was, there were times where I flirted with moving to Nashville and it never, it never really seemed like the right moment. I remember as in early twenties, uh, I remember driving down, down music row. Uh, and for, for people like music row, isn't Broadway where all the bars and all, you know, all the honky tonks are like music row is kind of a tucked away hidden street of two streets, you know, where just people they're they're just writing songs every day. And at least before 2020, they were writing songs in those houses together every day. And uh, I remember driving down that strip at one point and just thinking, man, like, how do you get in the door? How, do, how does someone in here hear your songs? And, um, and so I didn't move then. I didn't move years later. You know, it was, it was almost a decade and a half before we really moved to Nashville. And it was, uh, I'd been writing with some friends in Nashville at, at a, you know, years prior and a, a song that we wrote that didn't even have a demo, didn't even have a work tape from your phone. Uh, turned out it was on a Florida Georgia Line album and it made us pick our head up a little bit and go, wait, can I actually, can I actually write songs? Like, can I do this at a, at a professional level? And I think the Florida Georgia Line song was maybe the eighth song, eighth. It's in the top, for, it's in the first 10 of songs that I ever have ever written. So I was like, maybe 
maybe I actually can write a song. And, um, and so we did, we, we decided we'd give it six months and go from Atlanta to Nashville, Atlanta to Nashville every other week and, and write and see what happens. See if God opened any doors, see if he closed any doors. And we were totally fine with it. Like if he said, no, I don't want you to write professionally. And we were, it was fine. And we had a, had a good job. We loved where we lived in, in Atlanta, but we decided it was, it was very clear that was an open door to come to Nashville. And so we, we, we picked it up with that Florida Georgia line song. That's awesome, man. So that's, first of all, that's incredibly rare that one of the first eight songs that you wrote, is that literally like first eight songs ever or like first eight country songs? No, I think it's, it's, I think I've done the math. I think it is one of, I think it's like eight. I mean, I I think I had, um, I think I had probably seven songs that I really wrote on, on like my album. And I think that was just one that I, like maybe the first one that I, and you know, when you first do an album, you don't know anything about like making songs. Great. You just do the, like, you're like, I need seven songs in an album. I write seven songs, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. uh, and so it, 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 if it wasn't eight, it was nine or 10. And uh, yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to write necessarily country that day. We just sat in a room and, uh, I remember just even standing on the balcony. It was because I wrote it at Big Loud, um, which is a publisher here in Nashville. And uh, I stood on the balcony of Craig Wiseman's um, office. And Craig Wiseman's written songs like Live Like You Were Dying and The Good Stuff. And just, I mean, I think he has like 25 or 26, maybe even 30 plus number ones now. And I was sitting on Music Row on his balcony, looking at the cars go by, you know, probably a decade later and just thinking like, man, I didn't even... I didn't even try to get my song heard. Like, this is just, that's the way, that's the way it happens sometimes is when you stop, when you stop trying in your own might, you know, some things kind of happen. So. Yeah. That's, that's amazing, man. Well, yeah, as I said, that's incredibly rare. And uh, who, who, how did you, first of all, you know, get connected with Big Loud and who, who were you writing with at the time that was, uh, that was at Big Loud? Um, you know, I, I think when I first got to Atlanta uh, and I did that, that pop rock soul album, someone was like, Hey, you need to sign with BMI. And I, and I didn't, we, we even joke about it these days. Like, who'd you sign with? Sign with BMI or ASCAP or CSAC. It's like, that's not a, it's not a record deal. It's not a publishing deal. That's just a, you know, they just collect the money that if a song makes, you know? And so, uh, but I did, I, kn- I know that if, you know, you have big dreams and you go, maybe, maybe one day this song makes money. And someone said, sign with BMI. And so I, I went with BMI at the time. And, and there was a guy named Dave um, Clausen there that is, uh, he was just so good to me. And um, he played that really bad album in my head for, um, for Seth England, who is still at Big Loud. And then, and um, Craig Wiseman heard it as well. And, and he said, I think we should bring this guy up and, and let him write with some of our writers. And, and Craig is, um, he's a good friend now. And he, he was, he's brilliant. I, I think he sees, he sees into the future a little bit. And he saw like, there's this guy from Alabama who's in Atlanta doing hip hop uh, type of, you know, pop driven stuff. If we combine these Atlanta writers with these Nashville writers, you can create something that is like, unlike anything that anyone's really heard in country. And that was in 2008 and nine. So you think in 2012, Florida Georgia Line comes out with Cruise, which is something some no one's ever heard. It has like the hip hop and the country thing. And so I think Craig saw that kind of coming, but um, or at least he he felt like there was a shift in, in in the way the country was being written. And he loves Craig just loves doing something that no one's done before. Like he just gets a kick out of that, you know. And yeah. so um, and so we um, yeah, when we were we were writing, he would bring me up and like I would stay like two weeks. Um, and I would write with, uh, like I wrote with Kanan Smith. I wrote Grow Old with Florida Georgia Line, for Florida Georgia Line with Kanan Smith, who was a, is another country artist now and a really successful country writer. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it was just publishers back in the day or like guys that had publishing deals that I was writing with. And now I just, yeah, wrote it with, with uh, Kanan Smith. And, and then I went back to Atlanta and I didn't, really didn't think about it any, any more about coming to Nashville when um, – this uh, brown headed, brown eyed, green eyed girl, you know, kind of walked into uh, to a church that I was working at and we got married about nine months later. And it's like, well, who cares about writing songs in Nashville? This girl's amazing, you know? And so <laughs> we started our life there and didn't even look back. That's awesome. So w- were you drawn to writing country music over other genres or how did, how did that sort of evolve in finding your lane? Uh, you know, in high school, I was... I felt like I was like the anomaly a little bit. Like I was, I was in band, but I played on the basketball team. Like, right. I played like sports. I love sports to this day. Like, thank God that sports are back uh, on TV right now. Um, 
And so I, yeah, I played sports, but I also would go down the road listening to like Les Mis, like blaring Les Mis, like out of the, out of my old like Ford Ranger truck or my dad's Ford Ranger truck. Um, but then it would, I would shift and I'd be like, ah, oh, let me listen to that Brad Paisley song on the radio, you know? So it was like all these, all these ideas kind of coming together. Um, so I wasn't necessarily drawn to only country. It was, it was everything, you know, it was, uh, I would listen to Brad Paisley and then I would listen to Harry Connick Jr. And then I'd listen to, you know, Les Mis and then I would listen to some, some other classical thing and then a Stevie Wonder album, then Ray Charles. And it, like, it was a little bit of everything. Yeah. Well, I, I gotta say, I mean, the first time that, I, I heard your stuff, you know, I think, I think it was at one of our Academy events or something. I was like, who in the world, like this guy's, I don't know why, you, why you're not an artist. Like, or I, I, at least I didn't know you were doing it at the time. Your voice is just incredible. So, um, man, I, yeah, I, I, I just think what you, what you do naturally and what comes out of you is, is amazing. So, I appreciate it, man. There's just, I, I think even to like speak on that, there's, <laughs> there's so many artists that come into the studio all the time that it's their, it's their dream. It's everything they've, they've built their life around. Um, and one of my greatest joys is giving, giving them great songs to go live their dream, you know, let them be a part of it. Like it's, man, it gets me going in, in the morning, like every, every day it's like, man, what can we do? Can we change someone's life today with a song? And it's just crazy. We get to make that stuff up. Like for, you know, for Gabby with, I hope like you just, you, we made up a song it changed her life and it changed our life. And so I've never really, even though, yes, I am doing the artist thing. It's still not something that I'm like, if this all falls apart, it's going to wreck me. It, it, I don't care. Like I, I, I yeah. care enough about songs and I care enough about the project, but I don't care enough about it because I know that I can always have great friends who are much more talented than I am that we can give them great songs, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great way to look at it. So how often are you co-writing versus writing solo? Uh, no, I'm, I'm mainly, if I'm writing solo, I do, um, you know, song starts where it's like, Hey, we have this verse and chorus idea. Uh, and then just kind of go into the room and we finish it. I don't, I don't really write much by myself. Um, these days it's, it is truly a collaboration, a co-writing thing. Cause I think we're, I think there's value to writing, you know, a solo song, you know, by yourself, but I, I mean, so many times in my life, I'm just better because great people are around me, you know? So I, I want to trust those people around me. But I do know that when I do start a song on my own now, it's funny when you, you're not, obviously you're not stealing from anyone, but when you have that, those people who have written with you on a consistent basis, when you write by yourself, they're kind of still in the room because you know their instincts, you know, like, you know, there's been enough times when, when I've been coming up with an idea that John Knight, who, you know, I'm with at Sony would go, ah, but what if we did this? So, you know, if you start a song on your own, right when you get to that moment where you like something you're doing, you always have that guy or, or some other girl in the back of your head going, Hey, but what, I don't know. I don't, it needs more emotion right here. Right. This isn't a true feeling. And, you know, so yeah, it's all, it, if it's even writing solo, it feels like still co-writing. I'm just not going to put their names on it. Yeah, man. Tell me some of the stuff. Um, just since you, you, you just brought up John, you know, John, in case our listeners don't know, is just an incredibly prolific country songer. I don't know how, how many number ones he's had at this point, but you he, he doesn't know. <laughs> he'd tell you he doesn't know. Yeah, exactly. So uh, maybe, maybe tell us that story. How did you get connected with him? Man, it was, uh, I guess it was 2018, maybe. Well, yeah, 20, maybe 2017. I, like I just started, I, I remember I moved to town. Um, even with the Florida Georgia line thing, right. We moved to town. Um, and I was working at a place that, that moved me to town. It was, I wasn't writing songs and that thing just fell apart. It just fell apart. And then, um, there was a publisher who had offered a pub deal that, uh, that fell apart. So we moved to town with a cut. Sure. But we moved to town and it all fell apart. And so we were going, Oh my gosh, like, I picked up my daughter from her junior year of high school in Atlanta and I brought her to, to Nashville with my wife. And now we're just sitting here going like, what do we do? Um, and, and, and I've, I've always looked up to guys, especially dude, Seth, like you, like guys who are amazing songwriters who are even like even more amazing if you can be uh, producers. And like, mm -hmm. and I was noticing over my, my, just a couple of years in, in coming back and forth to Nashville the, the people who were consistently getting in the good rooms mm. uh, were the guys and the girls that could 
um, produce songs at the same time. It, it didn't need to be, it didn't need to sound like it was on the radio, but some sort of vibe that they would just give you in the room. Um, and so I thought to myself, like, if I can, if I can figure that out, if I can figure out how to produce, man, that would be, that would be massive. Um, and so I I'd never done it though. And so I remember uh, the first day of January, I, I guess it was 2017. Uh, it could be 2018. Uh, I think I just celebrated two years with, with Sony, but, um, I'm, I, I'm sitting in the studio. The, the room was different than it was back then, but I'm sitting in the studio that I, that I am in or that I was in now. And I remember thinking, how do I make something go boom, boom through those speakers? Like, how do I make the software actually make a kick drum, do something? Um, and so I just spent about 90 hours a week in that studio, figuring things out. Um, and from, from that day, from January one, I think we wrote that year, I wrote and produced, I hope, which was, I mean, it's, it's sitting at, currently as we're having this talk, you know, it's like seven on, um, on the top 40 pop hits, you know? And so, um, man. it's crazy. Yeah, man. And so, so I, during that time I had worked with Dane Schmidt over at, at Sony and he said, uh, he's like, Hey man, I just, I, I can only really sign track guys, right? Like that, that's what I need right now. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm working, I'm working. I would send him stuff every couple of months. Like he'd be like, it's actually like, he's, he's just, he's a guy from Minnesota. So he's just no, like, there's, there's no like filters. He's like, it's actually not bad. You know, it's not, it's not bad, Zach. Just keep working <laughs> on it. Uh, and you know, by, by June or so he's like, it's, it's actually pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, and, uh, and so he said there was one day he sent me a text. He's like, Hey, Hey, can you write with, with John Knight? Um, he, he's wanting to sign a track guy. And I was like, who's John Knight? I really didn't know who John was. I, I don't, I research the people that I write with right before I write with them, you know, unless they're like a hero of mine and, and John is now, but you know, and so he, uh, John and walked in the room to write that day. And we just, we became friends before we ever wrote a song. And it just felt like this is just, this is just a brother. This is another soul that I like we just do live together for sure. You know? That's awesome, man. And for, for people out there who don't realize, you know, there's a lot of creative ways that songwriters can, can, can do publishing deals with people. And um, this is what, what you would call a joint venture where, you know, John has been with Sony for a while. He, he brings a guy like Zach in to the fold. And so there's kind of a shared publishing arrangement there. Is that, is that kind of what it looks like? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, he gets a, yeah, cut in, but that's the, that's definitely the the simplest way of doing that. And it's, and it's great. It gets to, you know, it, he gets to develop a, a new writer, um, that will ultimately hopefully make him, you know, money one day. And, uh, I definitely want to do the same thing because he's, he's brought a lot of, um, man, I've learned so much from John just without, and it's not like he's just like, okay, now on this chorus, what we will do, it's not a teaching thing. It's just a, um, and like in the church world, we would actually call it discipleship, right? It's like watching someone just do something the right way for a long time, you know? And it's just, you just consistently watch him do it in the room um, without him teaching and you, you're just learning. So it's more, it's more caught than taught. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, there's so many things in life, right? I mean, we, could, we could talk for hours on that about, you know, how to, <laughs> how to be better just by, by watching and listening. Yeah. So that's awesome. Well, shout out, shout out to John. Um, yeah. So when you write a song, how much do you focus on like who the end intended audience is? Are you thinking about that at all? Is that, is that play into the process? Uh, yeah, sometimes it does. You know, there's um, luckily most, most of the time um, these days, like there's an artist in the room. So it's like, that's the person, you know, that, obviously that's the person that we're trying to write a song for. If it's Gabby Barrett, Barrett in the room, then we're like, all right. She has a very specific lifestyle. She has very specific filters that songs need to go through. So we're clearly writing specifically for her, but there's sometimes, you know, we're like the other day I was writing a song with um, Josh Thompson and this guy named Bobby Pinson. And like, we were like, all right, well this, this chord progression sounds just like something Chesney would do. So like we wrote a song for Chesney and it's honestly, if Chesney doesn't do it, it's probably a crash and burn song. Like it's probably just goes, we throw it on song mountain or toss it on a hard drive and it just lives the rest of its days there. And no one ever hears it. And that's, that's fine. But yeah, we, uh, there, there are days that we, we write toward an artist. It's not as much, um, as, as, you know, we probably, I don't know. I, I love writing with artists in the room. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun and it does help. It does help, you know, kind of up the, up the cut percentage. 
Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. What What's the, like, how often are you writing just with writers for pitching versus like writing with the artists? Um, I would say it's a, um, probably 75 against 25%. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm in the, in the room with artists 75% of the time, you know, some, yeah. some days, like the other day I was writing, uh, it was like the, we were there were three of us i think we were it was like jaron johnson who's in the cadillac three and then this this amazingly talented guy that you need to interview at some point named uh named breland and then and then me and we were like well all right so who's who's gonna get this on who's like we, we we all love this who's gonna get to to cut this song maybe we just do it together or you know whatever and so some days you get lucky like that but those have actually the ones where there's a lot of artists in the room you go like well dang like i wrote a song with uh with another uh, duo the other day. And I was like, wow, I kind of hope they don't do this song. Cause I'd love to do this. <laughs> stuff, <you know? laughs> that's good. That's, that's the feeling you want whenever you write a song. So, yeah. which kind of brings me right in my next question. How do you know when a song is done? Like when it's time to stop revising and just put it down? Uh, man, I, I'm such a perfectionist. I would tell you it's never done, you know, but like, I would tell you like, if, if we were all just able to, you know, on this podcast, sit in the living room and listen to, to Florida Georgia lines grow old, I would, I would pick apart every melody. I would pick apart like every landing of every phrase and go like, this isn't, this isn't done. This, this, that's the reason there wasn't a work tape there, or no demo. Like I didn't think the song was done. Um, so I've, I've learned uh, over the years now to just trust did it's it's actually good enough you know and like and, and that sounds terrible to a perfectionist but like you can start like i mean i'm glad they stopped painting at some point in the Mo mona lisa or it was just going to get weird you know what i mean like and so it was it was just perfect when it was good enough you know so um and that's a tricky balance it's something i've learned over the years and you know the other day we wrote um i wrote a song we we thought it was a great song and it was just, there was something about it that was still rubbing me wrong and a, and a pretty significant thing, like a whole entire verse. And I was like, ah, no, I think it, I think it needs another second verse. And so I wrote the second verse, texted it to the writer. Um, and the writer was like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's totally what it needs, you know? And so, so I think if it's something that's like really like irking you a little bit, go back and, and filter it. But yeah, I think it, I can think it can be done way quicker than, than I, I would give it at least. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So when you, you know, a lot of people have this sort of perception about when they, when they sign a publishing deal, it's like off to the races. That sometimes is the case for writers, but it sometimes isn't. Um, when you signed your deal with Sony, was that like, boom, we're, we're, you know, how did that change your career basically? Um, well, I, for, for me, again, I think I just got really lucky i mean it, it, but so because i've seen you know there's a several of us that signed to sony at the same time you know different there were different people that they were working with at sony and we've all had different careers you know some so i think it's i think signing a pub deal is similar to um when when someone leaves college you can look at it like okay well i got a degree now therefore i know everything mm -hmm. or you can look at it like i got a degree now I know nothing and I have to go learn how to actually do the trade that I'm, you know, <laughs> that I just got a degree to do, you know? And so, um, I think, I think you have to look at it like that of like, if you're always put yourself in like a posture of learning, then you, you kind of cuts the, the pride out of like, I can do this. If you, if you think like I can write a song all the time and, and I'm amazing at it, then you're probably not actually, you know, you know, it's, it's hard. So I think, I think once you get a pub deal, it's definitely not off to the races. I mean, there, there are those, those exceptions and anomalies. Um, and I'm very thankful I'm one of them, but man, those like, it's still not an overnight success. You know, there's, there's decades of work and, and hardship and, and all that stuff. And, and, but I, yeah, I think once you sign a pub deal, that's the time to really get working because that's when your team is around you. Um, and you can really capitalize on the momentum of it, but you have to become a better songwriter. You have to write with, with writers who um, are at the time when you first sign, you're not, you're not going to get in the room with um, Ryan Tedder from One Republic. Like when you first sign a pub deal, you know, you're, you're going to get in other in the rooms with people who are very good because they have a pub deal, but they may not be at the level of a, of a Ryan Tedder yet. And so you need to learn what you can learn from them. Um, and then 
hopefully you get better and better and better until you're in the room with with Ryan Tedder. I've never been in the in the in the writing room with Ryan Tedder. So <laughs> is, that, is that on the list? Uh yeah, no, I, I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of Tedder. I think he's I think he's amazing. Um yeah, I th- I th- it is on the list. There's a lot of people that are on the on the list and I'm coming for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll you, dude, I'm I'm surprised you haven't already. It pr- yeah. pr- probably this year. Yeah. Um so let's talk about I hope. I just, you know, that that song it's it's one that when we're writing with a new artist or we're, it just gets referenced so often now. Like how does that feel to have written a song that like other people are like listening to and saying, man, we need to make it sound like that or feel like that. Wow. Well, I didn't know that. So I didn't, yeah, that's crazy. That people and I'm would... sure it's, I'm sure it's not just me. Wow. Well, yeah, no, I, um, <laughs> that's crazy. I, yeah, I, it feels amazing, you know, to know that people are, you know, trying to chase something and that's what you do. Like, which is which is kind of interesting, you know. I heard uh, I heard an interview one time where it was like I think it was I think it was Charlie Puth, and he was just like, you know, at when you start like trying to chase something that's on the radio now, you're you're, you're going to miss it. But there is something with writing a, with a new artist that is a, and Gabby's exceptional. You know, what I mean, she's she's a true diamond that uh, that comes around like maybe once in a generation. You know, like the only other person that I know, and I'll get in trouble because I know I, there's so many artists that that I work with now that. But like, no, no one does what Gabby does. Like Gabby is truly special. Like that girl, like I hope is um, maybe the first to third vocal take of the day after not singing and just handing her an SM7 in a fire hall studio at Sony. You know, it's like. Is like that, is, is that the now. final vocal? Yeah, it's the final vocal. You know, it's wow. like, what are you doing? Like, and her, and her phrasing, man, like the way she, the way she sits, like. We'll, we'll be sitting in the studio and she'll, she, she will legitimately know. She'll go, Hey Zach, I didn't sing that phrase. That's right there in that verse too. I didn't sing like that. That's a little ahead of the beat. I didn't sing it there. I'm like, oh, and, and I'll be looking at the screen. I'm like, I haven't changed anything. Like, and she'll like, no, you did. And I tell you nine times out of 10, there will be something that shifted or something. And I'll be like, Oh no, you're right. You're totally right. And it, it will be microscopic, you know? And so there's, there's just not many people out there like Gabby. Uh, and I think I saw it early and, uh, and she's like a, she's like a daughter to me now. You know, I just, I think she's just, she's just the best. And so, um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy to be in a room with a new artist and because there's, there's, there's dreams there. They haven't been um, just beat down by the industry. You know, there's so many artists that walk in a room like, well, I'm going to, got to respond to my Instagram DMs. And it's like, man, you're getting to live your dream right now. And I know it's like, just because you live your dream doesn't mean that there's not ton of tons of work. You know what I mean? Like I live off songwriting, but there's been times where I do still 90 hour weeks, you know? Yeah. So yeah, but that's crazy, man. I'm glad the people are coming after that song. Come after it, man. We need some great songs out there. Yeah. Well, man, it's, it's so fresh and that's, so awesome to hear that yeah that's that's literally just it sounds like it's just so instinctive for her and i remember the first time i heard the vocal i was like holy cow like this is the today's you know carrie underwood or whatever comparison oh, yeah. people want to make you know but yeah it's just that that vocal that kind of comes comes along like you said once in a blue moon so yeah um, but, but the other thing i want to want to point out with with that is you know when you started working with her nobody knew who Gabby Barrett was either. Right. It was like, you know, so many people when they're starting out, they think, well, I need to get, I need to upgrade the rooms that I'm in. How do I get in the room with FGL or with whoever fill in the blank, right. or Carrie, Carrie Underwood. And sure. what they don't realize is like the best thing you can do when you're, when you're on your way up is like find those artists and you, you, you partner with them, you champion them, you, you become their people. Oh yeah. And, so was that was that kind of the case with 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 Gabby where you know it was it's it's you're investing on the front end right hoping hoping that something's going to pay off Yeah you totally do man I, I think you find the diamonds and you like you do your best to shine them you know it's uh yeah she it's it's hard because like there are those there are for every Gabby there's 10 people that I was in the room with especially early on that it's like I mean just didn't didn't do anything you know and and but that's fine like the investment is, is worth it. You know, you, you, you don't see biceps every day. You do a curl, you know what I mean? Like you, you get them over, you get them over time. I mean, yeah. I, like they, mine just pop immediately. Like yeah, a yours just, I was going to say, you have that, that special thing. That's yeah, that, 
Yeah, that's what they, that's, I mean, what's because of the Olympics. I, I trained so yeah. hard for the Olympics back in the day. Yeah. Never yeah. made it. Yeah. I'm about three, four. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, no, I think, man, like it is like finding someone you believe in. It is like, even if you're, I feel like so many writers get frustrated when they're like, I'm just not in the big rooms. Like you said, you know, like how do I get in there with, with Garth Brooks? Like everyone shoots for like, it's, you're not in the room with Gar, Garth Brooks because you probably don't deserve to be in the room with Garth Brooks. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm not in the room with Ryan Tedder because I don't deserve to be in the room with Ryan Tedder yet. And that, that moment may come, it may not come, but the more Gabby's that I help become Gabby Barrett's, the, it, it just makes the chances greater that I get in the room when, when Ryan Tedder's making an Adele, you know? Mm. Well, very, very well said. Very well said. Um, what's the best piece of advice you ever received regarding your songwriting? And it could be something from John. It could be something from, from your publisher. Ooh, the best piece of advice. Um, I, you know, I reference back to, to John a good bit, but what I like, I felt like I used to be early on, like I can put an emotion into a song. I mean, it's, we, I hope it was a joke kind of like we were trying to write a different song. Um, we were really, truly trying to write someone like a, I will always love you. Like it wasn't someone cheated on you. It was just like, we broke up and like, but I still love you and I want, I want the best for you. And so I like, we try to get that need rhyme, like everything you're ever going to need. And I spun around the chair, just joking. It was like, and then I hope she cheats because that was, a, and then it like hit this like moment where it was like, Oh wait, that's a real emotion. Like that's a, that is a true genuine emotion. That is not like, Hey, I'm, I'm up on a tractor and it feels pretty cool and breezy up here. And I like it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just a random thing. It was just like, man, that hit, that hit us all. And even as a joke, it, it became pretty serious pretty quickly, you know? And, and so John has like encouraged me over the, over the years to, to, to write a real emotion. You know what I mean? Like, um, and I can't like, there's not, well, okay. So like, um, Yeah, like when you when you have an idea that you're trying to deliver, if you say it in a just in a real way, like of just like, man, it's a hard day at work. But if there's a different thing of going like, I can barely make it through. Like there's a different there's a different weight, and just even that that's a terrible way of saying that. But like, it's a bad day at work. I barely made it through. Like there's a real emotion and I barely made it through that. It's like, no, I feel, I feel that person's angst a little bit that like they're in, they're in a painful place or they're in a happy place or whatever it is. And I think over the time of like, how do you, how do you put those, those, those ideas in a song, you know, and, and put feelings in a song. Uh, there's so many times, especially writing country where it's like, we'll get to the second verse. And I've heard it said so many times where, where they'll go, it doesn't really matter what we say. It just matters how it feels before we get to this chorus again. Mm. And, and those, I mean, if, if I was saying that three years ago, I'd be like, dude, it does matter what we say. But when you're writing with guys who have, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 number ones, you know, when they say that, it's like, well, they're probably right. You know? And so it is how to, how to make an emotion out of, out of something as opposed to um, making it clinical and sound the same way, you know? Yeah. So good. That's, that's, that's great advice. Same goes with melodies too. Like, does it feel right? Not, is it right? Does it feel right? Yeah. Yeah. So good. Um, a couple more questions and then we'll jump into our lightning round. Sure. What advice would you have for somebody wanting to become a professional songwriter? Write songs, write them all the time, write them with people who are better, worse, same, like just, just write songs. It, it truly is. And I didn't, I didn't understand it when I first, um, when I first got to town, like it used to frustrate me a little bit when, when Dane over at Sony, he'd be like, yeah, man, it's getting better. So keep, keep writing. They're not like, they're not hits yet, but keep writing. I'm like, what are you talking about? This song is a monster, you know? And it's like, and if I listen to that song today, I'm like, oh, wow, that song was terrible. You know, it just, it, it lacked all the things that would be, would make a hit a hit, you know? And, um, and I definitely know what's a, what's a hit these days because I've had one and only one, <laughs> you know, I, I have no idea. Like I'm still, I'm still improving, you know? And so, uh, but it, I would say just, uh, write, 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 write. Like, I mean, for sure, write all the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you definitely know what a hit is because that, 
that hit is bigger than a lot of most other hits out there. So, oh man, I appreciate it. It's fun. De- definitely now. So, hey, in closing, if there's one thing you could say to your younger self before you broke into the industry, what would that be? Uh, listen more, talk less. <laughs> Has nothing to do with writing. It's just, it, yeah, just listen more, talk less. Mm. Very, very well said. All right, well, you ready to jump into the lightning round? Yeah, let's do it. What is a song that you loved when you were growing up? Uh, God, there's so many. Uh, yeah, all right, so it's a lightning round. Uh, so, Ain't No Sunshine. Favorite fruit? Apples, every night. What's the best city you've ever been to, lived in, or visited? Nashville. It's the one. Hmm. Favorite fast food restaurant? Jesus Chicken. Chick-fil-A. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And what time of day are you most productive? Uh, from about midnight to about 3 o'clock in the morning. I rarely do it, but that's when I'm most productive. Seriously? Yeah, that's when, that's when the whole duo project birthed. Like it was in those, in those times, and that's when, that's when our best songs have been written. You have, you have kids, right? Well, yeah, she's 20. She's, she'll be 20 in November. So yeah. So she's, she's off at college and yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's late. Yeah, I don't do yeah. I don't do it like rarely. I mean, rarely. I did it. I think I did it. Uh, today's Thursday or Tuesday night. So I'm still catching up. Like I'm still very tired from it. But it's like, <laughs> I've got to write the, you know, the next morning. You know? Did you have like a scheduled midnight, write, Or did you just get up and you're like, man, I feel like doing this thing. No, it's like, you know, sometimes someone will FaceTime. It's like, hey, man, I have this idea. What are your thoughts? And, you know, or can you hop on? Like that night, it was like, a, hey, you were on this song when we were writing it. I think the vibe is is off. Can you come up with like, would you, just, would you just show us the vibe it needs to be? And then showing the vibe becomes cutting the vocal. And it's like, then, you know. Next thing you know, it's three in the morning. Yeah, exactly. And then you can't go to sleep. You know, you're like, well, well I'm up now. I'm going to watch some Tiger King. Yeah. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, well, we're going to, we're going to be doing our deep dive. As we said, you, you definitely know what makes a hit song a hit song because you've been a part of this, this monster hit with, with Gabby Barrett. We're going to be doing our deep dive on hit songs. So if people are interested in checking that out, they can head over to madeitinmusic.com. Sign up for the deep dives there and it will be right there. Zach Kale, thanks so much for being with us on the Made It Music podcast. Yeah, bro. My pleasure. What's up? Thank you for watching the Made It in Music podcast season three. If you want to check out any of the other episodes from season three, click up here. And we talk in the show about these really cool deep dives with all this extra bonus content. And if you want access to all of those, click here. <laughs>